All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Steve Cherry from the Nashville Technology Council. Uh, thank you for joining us for our uh, uh, event today, Job Search Tips for Navigating the COVID-19 Era. Uh, the panel today will be narrated from Kate O'Neill, co-founder of Teaming. And we also have with us uh, Paige Boyd and Tyler uh, Desson. They'll introduce themselves in, in just a minute. So I want to turn everything over to uh, Kate to begin our, our session. Hey there, everyone. Um, I hope everyone's having a, a good week. I'm excited to have you all here. Um, really, this is just going to be a, kind of a Q&A uh, with, with Taylor and, and Paige. Um, and I'm going to let them introduce themselves here now. Paige, go ahead. You okay. first. I was just going to say, who's going first? Hi, everyone. It's Paige Boyd. Uh, I am the owner of a, a local coaching and consulting company called Speaking Change. Uh, prior to that, though, I spent 10 years in staffing and another you know, 12 to 13 years in corporate HR. So I'm excited to be here with you today and share some of our uh, insights and learnings about the job search process. Uh, and hey, everybody. My name is Taylor Desson. Um, I work for Vaco in town. I've been recruiting for eight years. Uh, I'm a senior recruiter advocate, so I help manage a team of 10 recruiters. Uh, I work mainly with software developers in the market, um, and I have had the opportunity to speak at a handful of code conferences across the Southeast the last few years, um, and obviously, you know, really try to help educate the, not only the recruiting world, but the developer world on, on really how to work with recruiters. Um, you know, not only during this time, but uh, really just the job search in general. So I'm super stoked to be here. Thanks for thanks for inviting me. Yeah, yeah. Uh, let's let's start with you, Taylor. Um, <clears throat> you know, uh, from a recruiter perspective, right? Um, you know, you get a call from a recruiter, or you have a call set up with a recruiter. What's the best way to have a conversation and engage with a recruiter? Yeah, so I mean, this is this is the, a question I get a ton, and and it's it's you know I'm sure right now if if you haven't yet, um, you probably will be blown up, um, you know, over, uh, you know, um, LinkedIn a ton, um, on on how to work with recruiters, um, and and or just you're just overwhelmed, and you're probably asking yourself how do I even ferret out all all these recruiters, and so the the big thing. That I would add, that I would say first and foremost is something called the two and two rule that I say. Um, I would look to see if the recruiter has been um, at that same recruiting company for at least two years, and then also um, have been in the market specifically for two years. Um, I've been in Nashville for six years now, and I'm still learning about companies uh, in town, and so. Typically, this is a very unpopular opinion, but I still stand by it. Um, I had one of my recruiter friends actually just affirm me the other day on this uh, at Vaco, but um, usually recruiters who are not the best at their job, uh, they usually have to bounce around uh, to try to get their um, base raises because they can't hack it from a commission perspective. And so if you see a recruiter that's bounced around a few times, um, I'd, I'd maybe stay away from. But again, my team specifically, a lot of individuals are under that two-year mark. Um, I got hazed the other day about saying this because they're incredible recruiters as well. Um, so again, that's just a general rule um, on how to filter kind of through recruiters at just an eyeball test. Um, and then, um, you know, on the screen right now, there's a ton of questions to ask recruiters. And so I'm not going to go through all of them. Um, but if a recruiter sends you a job, uh, these are 10 questions that, um, that actually my team asked uh, our, our com companies that we work with. And so, um, you know, some of the questions right here, you know, uh, if, if it's a contract to hire role, is the budget approved to go full time? Um, how many other vendors are working on this position as well? Um, I had the unique opportunity to actually uh, speak at the Chattanooga.net user group and I shared this template and the uh, funny story is I had a developer use this template on me six months later. Uh, and so uh, it worked really well. But I think if you can save this and just email it to every recruiter, you'll definitely stump them. And, and really, I mean, uh, correct me if I'm wrong here, right? But a recruiter wants to put you in as much as they want the company to find the right role, right? Or the right person for the role. They also want to make sure that this is going to be a good role for you. Um, so I, I love that guidance on, you know, make sure they've been in the market, make sure they know a little bit about what the ins and outs of the job are, because um, they're really guiding the whole process um, for me as a candidate, let's say, and for the company uh, from a hiring perspective, uh, it's got to be right, 
right fit, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And Paige, I, I don't know if you have any thoughts on kind of all this as well. Yeah, I was actually, I love your question. I love them all, but number three really stood out. You know, I had mentioned I spent a lot of time in corporate HR. I didn't say specifically that about five to six of those years was leading talent acquisition at two local big companies. And so, you know, I want to add today that kind of the other side of that recruiter desk because Taylor and I talked a lot about all the different people that are in the process. And so number three is really, you know, a lot of times just being sure before you put yourself in the mix, you know, if you definitely need something that's going to convert or that's going to turn into something long term, you know, does that client have that position budgeted? Is it in the plan for the following year? I think that's just a real important question to ask. You know, things may be different right now, given the reason we're here is, you know, COVID-19 has changed the world for all of us. And so what I would say is it's probably a good time to maybe take a few risks that you might not normally. Um, I think, you know, maybe getting your foot in and getting started, a lot of things can happen over the next six months that none of us can anticipate. Um, yeah, so these are great questions. And, and the other thing I would say is Taylor and I share a love of like recruiters against recruiters. <laughs> I love his tagline on his LinkedIn. Um, even though we both are recruiters or have been in a prior life, um, there's, you know, we understand that sometimes being on the other end of that is a challenge. And so hopefully today we can share some behind the scenes advice too. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, okay. Um, first, maybe Taylor, yeah, you can answer this and then Paige sure. would love your opinion. But, you know, we're all in this digital world, right? And we want to make sure that we are, uh, as a candidate, attracting the right companies for the right roles. Um, can you share a little bit about what's the difference between what I should put on my LinkedIn and what I should put on my resume? Yeah, absolutely. So this is, I've gotten this question so many times over the last six, seven weeks. Uh, and, and this is just my two cents, right? And, and again, I'm all, I always come out of place in the sense of, I know I'm only one recruiter, right? And, and there's a ton of recruiters out there. Paige, Paige and I've chatted offline. We have different thoughts on different things. And that's what makes it, that, that's what makes working with a few recruiters at one time um, uh, just so important because you can get different voices. I mean, right now in this market, I would say if, you're, if you do not have a job, I'd work with up to four of us right now. Um, usually in a good time, I say work with one or two. Um, and so right now, just kind of sidebar, work with up to around four of us because we don't work with everybody in town. Um, every recruiting every recruiting company has their own book of business. So just FYI on that. So let's get obviously to the question. I have a tendency to go all over the place. But okay. um, yeah, so uh, LinkedIn uh, versus your resume. So um, the example up, up on the screen right now is actually from a dear friend of mine um, that I, I made when I worked in a Raleigh office for a year. Uh, his, his LinkedIn is written really well, but in a nutshell, your resume, your LinkedIn should be a summary, um, uh, of, of essentially, um, it, it should be a summary of your resume. And so that, that's incredibly important. Um, you know, for me, he outlined a lot of different areas, um, of what he's done, um, which is, which is incredibly important. But your resume should be a little bit more detailed and your LinkedIn should be obviously a little bit more, um, you know, at a high level. Paige, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. No, I totally agree. In fact, I think one of the questions that came in through Slack and maybe we'll get to later is really how to make your resume stand out. Um, and we can talk about that, you know, specifically though, I used to always tell people, this one got me the you know, this hiring, the so I gotta hiring managers, I don't know what that is. I'll just keep talking. Sure, um, keep going. Recruiters and hiring managers get flooded a lot of times with resumes, right? And so you want to, you know, you've probably heard the sound bite that recruiters spend seven to 10 seconds on a resume. And in a lot of cases, that is, that is true. Um, but you want your resume to stand out in the, the areas that you feel like you have unique strengths that align to the job. And so I always encourage people, whatever the result is, like your, your resume should be written in terms of results, not responsibilities. People want to know what you uniquely have done, not what the job description says. And so when I'm helping clients with resumes, we really hone in on like bolding and italicizing, you know, just the few words that represent the outcome, the result that they got. What was different in the job as a result of their work? I think that's great advice from, from a person who's a hiring manager, right? I, I look for those things, right? What are, what are the keywords, what are the key skills 
right? That, that are coincidentally often the key words I'm looking for in a resume. Um, yeah. I love that this is bulleted. And honestly, you know, I've, I've struggled with this as a candidate myself, right? It, I might be looking for two different type of roles, right? In, in this instance, we've got a, a program manager and a software developer um, that he's got both of those skills. You know, I like that I can quickly kind of bang down his, his LinkedIn profile and see, all right, he's got strong skills in both these areas. Um, he's concise to the point. Um, and by the way, I'm assuming that this is a man, could be a woman too. Um, it is, it is. <laughs> it is my good friend, David Green. Okay, okay. Um, but, but um, you know, I think uh, this is something from a hiring manager perspective, I, I can look at this and, and consume quickly and, and understand where the, the talents, uh, where the talents lie. So um, I think that's great. Uh, we lost you there for a t for a second, Taylor. I don't know if there's anything else yeah. you want to add here or uh... no, no. I mean, I, I think you know, I come at everything from a software development perspective. So I think if you want to summarize your LinkedIn in a few bullet points, it's you know, first bullet point: tell me what you're doing. Like you're describing it to a non-technical person, right? I'm developing the notification, you know, that pops up on this app, right? When you order food. Um, and then your second bullet point is, you know, kind of really talking about the technologies you're specifically using to solve that application, to develop that application. And then the last bullet point is kind of your entire tech stack that you're working with. And, and, and the reason why I include kind of that third bullet point is because recruiters search on keywords. And so I think it's important to have your LinkedIn and your resume littered with keywords. And I know a lot of, um, a, a lot of individuals don't like to just throw in a bunch of, you know, tech jargon, but, but it's incredibly important. That's, that's great advice. Um, we've, we've got a question uh, from the audience here from, from Mike. Um, do e one, do either of you help with resume writing or optimization? And if not, um, where do you recommend going for, for that sort of thing? Paige, you first. Well, I was going to say, Taylor, you want to go first? Um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I do, you know, what I would say, and you guys know this, if you've ever sat down and written a resume, resume writing, I mean, it's hard work, right? I mean, it's not hard in that you don't know what you've done and you don't know what you're capable of, but it requires a lot of reflection and a lot of deep thinking. And it's pretty detail oriented because you cannot have mistakes. You cannot have typos, right? Mm -hmm. So the first thing I would say is for the most part, I would not encourage people to to have to just spend a lot of money um, on getting someone to help them, right? Because nobody knows you better than you know you. So first, you know, try to do it yourself. Download their free templates everywhere. Really, the key is just to be um, specific, you know. And I always tell people the resume is to get you the interview, right? It's not to get you the job. So you do want to put your best foot forward and represent yourself in the best possible, possible way. People always ask me, can I embellish? Well, absolutely. I mean, this is a marketing tool, right? You're selling yourself. As long as when you get in the interview, you can back it up with facts, right? It has to be true. It has to be you that's really done those things. Um, if you're not one, like certainly I have clients that come and say, yeah, I hear you, but I'd rather outsource it because, you know, I don't have it in me to do it, right? Um, and, and that's fine. In those cases, I mean, you can Google local resume writing support, local resume writing, tons of companies will come up. You're gonna find some that'll help you do it for you know, a couple hundred dollars up to a couple thousand dollars. Um, it really is you know, what, what you're willing to invest. Um, you don't need to spend several thousand dollars you know, on a resume. The other, I guess the last thing I would say is even if you were to come to me or any other company, there, we're going to have to, you're going to have to be highly engaged, right? Like, I don't know what you've accomplished, right? And so you have to provide the, the bulk of the content. What I would do or some other company would do is really just try to put it in a framework, you know, um, put maybe some words in it that are going to be attractive to hiring managers and recruiters. We're going to sharpen it up and make it look good but the content has to come from you that's great advice um and just uh we've we've got some more questions rolling in here um for everyone on um we're going to get to all of them we, we've got some some sort of pre-content that we want to get through so if i don't um call out your your question yet we are going to get to it um so just want to make sure everyone knows that um we will we'll get there if we're not quite there yet 
Um, one thing I think that I would love to, to make sure we're all on the same page about, and um, Paige, maybe you can answer this first. Um, can you give an overview of the different types of recruiters that there are and who is involved in the process of hiring a candidate? Yeah, so um, Taylor, jump in here. I certainly will. And, you know, so I, as I said earlier, I started my career very similar. Um, Taylor and I share a lot of similar backgrounds. So I was in staffing for 10 years. There are people on the front end who are just sourcers and screeners. And then what we call someone that had full responsibility for a desk, like life, full life cycle recruiting, you know, that would work with multiple companies. Then you might have some that are dedicated to just a few companies, right? And all of that I put in the camp of external recruiter. So any agencies in town, whether it's, you know, frontline to executive um, roles, and those people work hand in hand, frankly, um, with people inside corporations, small and large companies, right? So sometimes they may be working with um, the direct hiring manager, they might be working with a corporate recruiter, they might be working with an HR partner, um, they might be working with a CEO or general manager, it kind of depends on the size of an organization. But, but the most common scenario we see is, you know, where a hiring manager or a corporate internal recruiter is reaching out to a partner agency um, and sharing a, a job spec or a profile, you know, a need that we're looking for. And it's really very much like a partnership, you know. And so the, the process is often, you know, external recruiter sources candidates presents maybe the top candidates and then an internal recruiter is doing their screen right and then that's passed on to sometimes the hiring manager or an hr partner and so what i think you're getting at kate right is oftentimes the process can feel very complex it can take a while um, and knowing you know kind of where you are in that process at least helps you have some patience or you know understand a little bit more about what you can do and when you might just be in a holding pattern. Um, hey, Taylor, let you take yeah. it from there because I know you've got a, a unique perspective there too. Yeah, I mean, I, I, well, I, mean, I think you just crushed it, right? I, I think there's, you know, for, I mean, I don't really- Why we spend time together, Taylor? <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I, I think, uh, you know, for me, I, I think there's validity to, to both. I, think, I mean, again, so I'm on the agency side. Um, but then I, you know, I know, you know, a ton of really great corporate recruiters as well. And so, um, yeah, I mean, those are, those are the kind of the two main types. And then, I mean, you can get kind of specialized. vaco has got a ton of specialties. Um, you know, I think another thing that just popped in my mind, I would ask the recruiter if they do have a specialty. I think that's an important question to ask. Um, because, um, I work with everybody in tech, but my specialty is the software development. Right. And so, you know, if, if, you know, but, but I say that and I recently just, you know, place the project manager. And so, you know, I, I think, I think if you can have somebody who's within your general skill set, um, who you can kind of nerd out with, I, I think is incredibly important. Um, and I think all those questions, I think that we shared a few slides ago is obviously incredibly, you know, applicable to, to both the agency and the corporate side. Yeah. And I think too, um, from a candidate's perspective, right, I've been through this before where I talk to the external recruiter. I think we've had a great conversation and then, and then I'm passed to another recruiter and I'm like, well, I don't necessarily understand um, until I get into the conversation where I'm like, oh, okay. Like I was talking to someone at an agency. Now I'm talking to the act, someone who actually works for the company that is looking for for a role, right? To fill a role, um, and then typically I'm talking to the person who would actually be my manager, um, yeah. or you know, someone who actually knows more about the role, or or is the direct responsibility or has a direct responsibility for whoever fills this role. Um, <clears throat> so I just from a process perspective, understanding, hey, you you're gonna have conversations with multiple people that are. Um, trying to understand a little bit more about your skill set that might not be um, in, you know, they're not a software developer themselves, right? Um, or a project manager or whatever. Um, so there might be some, uh, you might be talking about the same thing a little bit um, through that process. Um, just setting that expectation, I think, um, is good. Well, um, yes, I totally agree. I'm glad you said it that way because it reminded me of something we talked about and which, you know, Sometimes what happens is as a recruiter, I might not find the exact profile in a candidate that I'm looking for, but I find somebody that meets maybe 
you know, seven out of 10, right, of the kind of highlights or four out of five. And so I want to talk to them and I then, you know, I really like them. Like they have a really interesting background. They have a really good set of experiences. They seem really relevant. So I want to have a couple more people talk to them. Mm -hmm. And what through that process is they talk to other people, other people come back and go, well, you know what, they actually are a great fit for this role over here, that maybe yeah. I wasn't working or my team wasn't working, right? And so a lot of times that happens. Um, and just trying to keep the mindset, and it's hard, you guys, you know, one of the things that we talked about is we've all, we've all been through a job search. And I see Steve's, you know, putting up some of the top tips. I mean, searching is hard, right? And so just trying to have the mindset that one, you know, it is going to feel like a full-time job and just, uh, you know, kind of leaning into that from the get-go and kind of thinking about time prioritization and trying to keep the positive mindset of if I just keep one step in front of the other and talking to a bunch of people, the right thing is going to land. It just will, right? It might not land exactly the way you thought it would or in the exact place, but um, there is nothing more valuable than leveraging your connections and, you know, thinking about that target set of companies. Um, well, and Paige, oh, I may interrupt yeah. you real quick because I, I think you said something fantastic. And I've been talking to obviously a, a ton of individuals about this. Like the job search process is like not something you like wake up and do for like two hours while you're sipping your coffee. Mm -hmm. And then like you're done for the day and you go binge watch Netflix. Like, like I have a full-time job networking, yes. right? Like, like you have a full-time job networking. And so like networking is a full-time job. And so if the expectation is that you're going to wake up in your pajamas and like get on the internet and like shoot off some text messages and close your computer done for the day. I mean, I'm going to be honest with you, it's just wrong. Right. I, I, I think you need to be very prepared um, to get up early and you need to get up early because all those individuals that are on the job search are hitting the job boards first thing in the morning. Right. And so incredibly important that you get up and get rolling but then also to like go through the steps, right? Message people on LinkedIn. I think right now a lot of a lot of developers or a lot of individuals, I'm like, you have to be a recruiter, and they're like, well, what is that mean, right? And so and I don't know if I'm skipping ahead, but I mean, I think it's messaging people on LinkedIn that are in your network. I think it's opening up your phone book, right? People are like, well, I don't know how to use LinkedIn. I don't know how to use social media. Open up your dang phone book, yeah. right? And I say phone book, it's funny. I, I'm like an old man. Like, no, open up your contact list in your phone. Uh, I don't even know what a phone book is. I got to. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, um, uh, yeah, so, I mean, all that being said, like, it, it, it is work and it takes time. But the, the one little nugget that I, I want everybody listening to take away with is it's one intentional conversation a day. Just one. Mm -hmm. Hold yourself to at least one call. You know, we can't do coffees. Maybe you can do coffee like, you know, 12 feet apart. But like one call, one coffee, one Zoom a day with somebody in your network, that will snowball. My dad did it not in the tech industry. He's, he's in the restaurant industry and found a job in three months doing that. Mm -hmm. That's wild. Um, that actually reminds me, we've, we've got a question here um, from the panel, and I think it's the perfect time for it. Um, should we put aside some of our wants, needs in the company job we accept now since the job market is so hard pressed? Oof, that's a really good question. Taylor, uh, Paige, take that one. <laughs> okay. So here's what, again, for me, again, two cents, just my thoughts. I would say yes and no. Very black and white, that answer, obviously. Um, so, not an answer. Yes. No. Yeah. yeah. I, so I, I, think, I think you need, you need to, um, so this is one thing that I preach a lot. Before you start the job search, you need to specifically know why you're looking, right? So if you still have a job, why you're looking. And then, and then specifically write down what are non-negotiables for you, mm -hmm. right? So like, is, is, is distance a non-negotiable, right? Is pay a non-negotiable. And I would have one to three things that are non-negotiables. And then yes, right now, if maybe number four through six isn't what you want, like, or isn't providing it for you in this new job offer, if one and three are met, you need to take it. Mm -hmm. Right. I, I, I think, I think there needs to be awareness, right? I have a podcast, a little self plug here, guidance counselor 2.0, but um, I actually interviewed um, uh, two of my dudes at, at Vaco in Raleigh and Tampa. And we, we kind of had this whole podcast around deploying empathy in the job search, right? What does that look like? Not only from a hiring perspective, but also a candidate perspective. 
And deploying empathy in this specific case is, okay, I understand the job search is tough. There's not a lot of jobs out there. They give me one to three. I probably need to go ahead and, and accept the offer. So that, that's my two cents on that. I agree. Um, and I, you know, I was joking with you, Taylor, about saying yes and no, which is really just another way of saying, well, it depends, right? Which is yeah. what I <laughs> and, yeah. and really, I think you hit it right very simply when you said, I mean, it comes down to what are your priorities, right? And priorities shift. But right now, if your priority is a paycheck, then yes, absolutely, you should be switching, you know, giving up some things. If you have time, you know, if you can, if you can take a break um, and you have the time to kind of decompress and, and be more um, strategic in the choices that you make, then absolutely do that. But we're not all in that position, right? And so one of the things I get asked all the time is like, how long should I anticipate this lasting? And I always say it really depends, right? You make that list of non-negotiables that, that Taylor talked about. And then we look at like, okay, well of those, what are the target companies you're willing and interested in working in, right? And that could be 20, it could be five. And then what are your expectations, right? And how often are those expectations gonna be available in our market right now? Um, a lot of times people ask me about relocation. And you know, what I encourage people is if you can't relocate, that is just fine. Just accept that as your reality and stop looking at opportunities that aren't in Nashville, right? Or wherever you're located. Um, it reminds me too of that third bullet that, that Steve put up, which is accept that there is no silver bullet. I put this in, this is from a talk years ago that we adjusted for today. And so often people ask me like, I just tell me what to do, Paige, right? <laughs> I get clients they are like, just tell me the 10 things that I need to do. And then if I do those 10 things, I'll have a job in three months. And it's just never that easy, right? You know, you've got to post for jobs. You've got to network like crazy. Um, I encourage people to target two networking meetings every single week, two, every single week, right? It's like a sales funnel. The more opportunities and, and connections you put in the top, the, you know, those that come out at the bottom, the right one will come out, but you, it's a bit of a numbers game. Um, Steve just flashed up this next one, which we all, you know, this, at first glance, this comment seems a little negative, but when you understand kind of the story behind it, right? Um, we were chatting about, you know, I spent a lot of time in my corporate life with hiring managers, doing a lot of debriefs, you know, after the interview. And time and time again, I would hear, they have everything on paper that I'm looking for, but gosh, like, they're just, they seem down, they seem negative, right? They're just mad about their last situation. And one of one of them at one point said to me, you know, Paige, bitter is just never a good look. And I just thought that's so profound, right? Like how do we help ourselves not stand in our own way? Because so often as candidates, we get in our own way, right? And so where you can either, you know, have a trusted advisor, have a friend that you talk to prior to going into an interview, but whatever those bad experiences are, we all have them so recognizing you know we're not you're not alone but you gotta kind of leave them at the door and don't let them show up in that interview for you i think that's a good time for for another question we we have here um and and i think this is unfortunately happens so often um and i think the recruiters against recruiters uh will have an opinion about this but um there it, it's happening more than more more and more where you're applying for jobs that you're more than qualified for um you go through their application process you might even go through a few um rounds of interviews and then you get a canned rejection response mm -hmm. um and that's super frustrating right like you as a candidate you've put in a lot of work and time to making sure that um you know you're putting your best foot forward um that you're you're leaving your bitterness at the door um and then it seems like they might not have time for you to send a personal hey here's why we didn't go with you right so one question i have and i think everyone would benefit from when that happens how do you get that personal feedback how can you say to that recruiter or hiring manager please give me the feedback as to why i didn't get accepted for this role Taylor, yeah, to... yeah, it's it's so funny. I was thinking about this talk this morning. Um, I had, I've received two vague um, rejections from my candidates. 
and I was thinking about because we were gonna obviously give this uh, give this little panel, and uh, I, I chuckled because I was like, "Great, here we go!" Like I, I'm currently I'm in it, right? I'm I'm dealing with with you know clients, um, you know, giving vague feedback. I, recruiters get a bad reputation, right? And rightfully so. There's a lot of us out there that are only in it for us, only in it for the money, don't really care about the candidate experience, um, you know, and 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 totally get that. However, a lot of times the feedback is one of the, the, the most negative things about recruiters is that, well, I never get feedback. I never get feedback. I'm going to be totally frank with you. Neither do we. <laughs> I mean, like it is unreal. The vague feedback from hiring managers. Um, now that's, that's kind of two sided one. A lot of times we're working through a talent acquisition individual. So a, a corporate recruiter um, who essentially is getting the feedback from the hiring managers. Um, and so it's not directly to the hiring managers. So the hiring manager probably within their organization is, is probably, you know, giving vague feedback and that's the way they do things. I, I think, I think this is where deploying empathy needs to happen. Right. I think, you know, right now I went from working with 10 people at any given time on average to 50 people. Right. So I five X what's going on right now. Um, and, and, and hiring managers are dealing with that too, right? I, I think there needs to be a, a very balanced line of the hiring managers being res responsible and giving some sort of feedback, but also if they're giving feedback for all of the candidates that are interviewing, that's going to, that's going to be extreme. That's going to, that's going to take a lot of time, right? So it's understanding that, Hey, listen, maybe that manager deploying empathy, maybe that manager is overrun. What I would say to do is just tell the recruiter, I don't care what feedback you get, good, bad, or ugly, please give it to me. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to be totally honest. I'm not great at it sometimes. Sometimes I feel bad. God, I don't want to deliver this feedback. This person works so hard, I, they're going to be crushed. I have, I, so sometimes I don't even do the best at it, right? So, so I, think, uh, I think giving the recruiter the permission to, to do this is, is obviously you know, incredibly, um, incredibly valuable. Yeah, you know, oh my gosh, there's so many different ways to come at this. Um, I was sitting here thinking about how to take something that really could be a whole hour talk in itself <laughs> and kind of consolidate it down to a few bullet points that would have meaning for people. Um, the first thing I would say is um, one of the things, as I led large teams of recruiters, you know, there's different levels of experience, right, that recruiters have. And so when, when we're young in career as new recruiters and we're learning the job, oftentimes delivering that feedback is such an uncomfortable thing, right? And it is just easier to just say, you know, we're moving, we're just going some other route. And I'm not excusing that. I'm not saying it's okay. I'm just trying to share, like, in reality, sometimes you're working with someone that just does not have the experience and skill set to deliver it in a way that they, that you're going to hear it, or they're just choosing the easy answer, which is not to provide any. A lot of times it's what Taylor said. The hiring manager has been extremely vague and the recruiter maybe not, doesn't have the confidence or doesn't have the support to push back on the hiring manager for more, right? So there's there's that going on. The other thing that I would say is, you know, as you get more experienced and as you just kind of learn, you know, over time, um, how much more valuable it is and how much more candidates appreciate, you know, even though you know it intellectually, you still struggle to get it out in a way that makes sense, right? I've see, I've listened to so many recruiters deliver that, and when we, you know, they hang up and we do kind of a in the moment coaching, and I go, "Well, how do you think that went?" And they were like, "I don't, you know, I don't know," and we both, I'm like, "Yeah, I don't think they understood what you were trying to say, right? Like yeah. you're trying, so yeah. they moved, they're trying, but they don't, they're sugarcoating it or they're kind of dancing." And then finally, one of the ways that, you know, we coach recruiters um, to do it is really just to ask you the candidate, right? Like, well, how do you think it went? And more often than not, candidates would say to me, well, I thought this I really nailed, this I really nailed. When it got in this part, I was either flubbing my words or I went way off on a tangent or I could just tell by their body language that I wasn't hitting it out of the park. And that opens the door because then they're, they're open to being vulnerable and we can have a dialogue about, okay, so what do you think, you know, might have, you know, you might do differently next time or what do you think, what did you wish you had done? So a lot of times you as a candidate, I mean, we know because we could tell, you know, when an interview goes great, more often than not, you know it. When it's not going great, you feel it, you may not know exactly. 
Um, the other thing, just to answer, because it was a very specific question, um, and it kind of dovetails into personalized thank you notes. I can't tell you the number of times I would have candidates who really were impressive, but for one reason or another, they just didn't show well that day. They just weren't on their game, you know, as we might say, um, or they just weren't exactly the right fit, right? And they would write me, um, you know, just drop me an email, send me a text, write something that just says, hey, I get it. I understand there were other people for my own development, for my own search, you know, is there anything you could pass on to me? And who doesn't want to help, right, in that scenario? So nine times out of 10, I would either pick up the phone and call the person and go, hey, I don't have a ton, but here's what I did here, you know, or here's what I heard, it wasn't a lot, but here's how I interpret that, how do you interpret that? And together, you know, me and the candidate would kind of figure out like, okay, what does that mean? So I highly encourage, the other thing about personalized notes, um, recruiters right now, they are just flooded. You know, they're flooded. Um, and we haven't touched on this yet, but, it, but I'm sure we're about to, which is this is such an unusual time that a lot of people are asking me, like, should I pause my search? Like, should I hold off, right? And I, full stop, no, you should not, right? Now is the time to be full steam ahead because the market is going to bounce back. And certainly when it does, you want to be kind of top of mind for people. But in those scenarios, you know, when people would write me a personal note or drop me a personal line, and it doesn't have to be handwritten, it, just something that tells me like, wow, they really listened, they really heard the pain point that my company is going through. They created, you know, a brand for themselves in my mind, right? They differentiated themselves from the 10 other people that I might have talked to that day. So I really can't encourage that enough. You know, and one, one thing, personal experience I, I speak from here, um, there was a job I wanted um, years ago so badly. I went through the final rounds of interviews and I didn't get it. Um, and I just, I thought I would be perfect for the role. I thought the role was perfect for me. I thought the company was great. And I was so disappointed. Um, and I pushed for that feedback. Um, and I got something back that was so trivial. Um, and to me, it was a reflection of, of them. Um, and it made me realize like, yeah, I really wanted this job, but it made me realize like, you know what? I don't think I would have been successful working for someone mm. who could give that type of feedback. It was rough. Um, oh, and, and it was so little, right. That, that you're like, well, all right. You know, look, if, if, it, it made it easier for me the 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 negative feedback right which is is hard to hear um it made it easier for me to detach from wanting that job or feeling less than um so i don't know if if you guys have had that experience but from a candidate perspective you know yeah we learn from that feedback um and it, it you got to take it and run with it um for sure um but sometimes getting bad feedback um is sometimes a reflection of someone else um and it makes you learn like you know what dodged a bullet there so for sure. yeah i think i i, I think I, I know this this specific panel is targeted more towards a job seeker but are there any hiring managers on this call uh be careful uh yeah with your feedback um i think right now while there are a lot of candidates i'm starting to see clients so we went from a candidate recession with what I call this sort of no cans on the market. The candidates had the upper hands, like all the candidates. And so the clients I think are picking up on that and will be, I think, exerting their power a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I, so I will, I will, would be cautious for any hiring managers on here to, to be very diligent with your feedback because I am currently working with a client right now whose feedback is um, very nitpicky and vague to the point where um, the people who I am working with um, are getting a little turned off. Um, be, be because of that. So just just know that you know if it, you know the the feedback you're giving, if it's not true, um, because the recruiters for the most part are asking the questions of what was talked about in the interview. And if you're saying that you're rejecting the candidate based off certain topics that you spoke about in the interview, but the candidate's telling me that y'all never talked about it, that's not a good look. So be cautious on that. That's great advice. In fact, um, oh my gosh, I'm so glad you said that because I hadn't thought about the fact that we might have a lot of hiring managers on this call. Um, hey, Steve, if you could put up, I think there might be a couple more bullets. I want to come back to Kate's, yeah, number seven, um, what Kate was referring to a little bit, right? And I'm so glad you brought that up, which is 
like don't just because this is a really unique time and I know it's the easiest time to really lose um, hope and confidence and right start to lose yourself and when you've been at it I have a client right now who's who's been searching for a while you know she's kept her full-time job the whole time but she's trying to make a pivot into um, another discipline and so she just keeps getting rejected because she doesn't have that specific experience right and what we're working on is the fact that she's kind of lost her confidence a little bit as a result of that and she's starting to downplay her own expertise to fit in right what they're looking for and I love what you said Kate that like sometimes you know reading between the lines or hearing the feedback can cause you to go well wait I might not want to work at this company after all maybe I thought I did but now I've just learned something which is truly a great nugget in terms of what this person values or the culture of the company. And that is huge, right? And so don't sell yourself short. And, you know, um, at some point, I'm sure we're going to talk about maybe the wrap up, like what's the number one piece of advice, you know, we would give people as they go out. You know, certainly one of those is to just really know yourself and what's going to make you happy. Mm -hmm. and not to settle you may have to settle short term right if your priority is that paycheck like we talked about but always coming back to like at the end of the day life's too short to to be in a role where you don't feel valued and appreciated and so you know kind of sticking to your personal values um i want to close this out with just number six you know taylor and i are both big fans of you know i think you know online search is the way the world works you know right now I will say when I started in recruiting so many years ago <laughs> there was no LinkedIn really uh, dating myself but but now you know everything is online and certainly that's the way to go um, but the number of times that we would hire a referral um, especially if you find yourself if you're at a point in your career where you're trying to pivot or you're trying to move into an area that you haven't worked in before like networking is the key to your search right and so finding someone that works at that company right now that would advocate for you is going to be so much more valuable than any posting and applying and you still need to do those things right um but you know working your network um is the number one thing i would say for anybody that's looking to to transition into you know maybe a different discipline such such good advice um i know we've got um we've got some more questions here um from uh you know from before and from the panel but i wanted to turn it over to steve um just so that make sure we got it in um, before the the end of the hour um some of the resources that ntc is putting together for all of us on the call to, to find jobs yeah the technology council on uh may 12th um from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. hosting a virtual job fair. For anyone that's interested, this will be a place uh, to be able to go onto the job fair, three-dimensional booths on the screen to visit, get information about companies that are hiring. That are hiring. Uh, their recruiters will actually be there live to chat with you. You can apply for the positions that are listed, uh, and some of them may even want to do video uh, chats with you. All that, uh, all that is there for anybody that wants to participate. Uh, go to technologycouncil.com slash job fair uh, to sign up. You have to register on the site, up, upload your resume. It'll send you an email and then on the day of the event, you can log back in at 10 a.m. Central or anytime between 10 and 3. You don't have to be there immediately and you don't have to stay all day. Just anytime you can come and go. Uh, so we want to get that out and we'll, we'll show this slide up again in a few minutes uh, toward the end so everybody can get the information. Great, um, and and one more plug. Um, we've got a we've got a, a Slack channel going um, for uh, this group in particular, um, where we're posting um, any new jobs that are becoming available. Um, so if you haven't gotten into that Slack group yet, we'll make sure we follow up uh, after this uh, webinar with an email um, to make sure you can get in uh, if that's of interest. So. Um, very excited uh, to, to have the whole crew here. I'm going to kind of run through some of these questions because I want to make sure we have time for them. Um, <clears throat> so real quick from, from the, the group here, um, someone's heard that uh, crafting your resume to the job you're applying for um, might be a good thing to do. <clears throat> what is the right balance of actually changing your resume to apply for a job um, versus using the same thing every time i think uh i think i think it's absolutely necessary your your resume should be a living breathing document 
Um, but I also think too, you need to have a specialty, right? I, I was dealing with one individual the other day and literally this individual sent me 13 different versions of his resume for 13 okay. different types of jobs within IT. Mm -hmm. And I said, uh, love this. This is great that you spent the time to, to do this, but I need like two. Like, what do you really, like, what are your top one to two positions, right? And so I think that's my thing. I think, um, I think your resume should evolve with the job posting, um, but also like, don't go over the top, right? Like if you're a software developer and you, um, you know, are currently doing .NET, um, you know, with, with no Angular, and then your resume is littered with, you know, kind of vague Angular, uh, you know, bullet points and, just just know that like you're gonna get grilled on that right so I, I think staying in your lane um is is incredibly important but also crafting your resume per job posting okay that's great that's great advice um another another question here from the group um do you have any recommendations or templates we can use on linkedin to contact people we don't know at companies who are interviewing and or to target companies that they're looking to work for just be yourself. I, that's all I got. No templates. I think, I think right now, and I'm telling this to my recruiting team, uh, right now is not the time to have templates, right? right? Everybody like the, the more one to one, what I call hand to hand combat, the more one on one intentional conversations you can have via Twitter, LinkedIn. Um, I say Twitter cause it's a huge software community tool. Like the ton of software developers are on it. Um, you know, the more you can go like, Hey, listen, I don't know who to contact be vulnerable. I think that's going to separate yourself Paige. Yeah, I agree. I was going to say, um, templates, not, no, not necessarily. I do have some guidance though. And one is what Taylor just said, which is try to find a way to, um, show up as your unique self. Right. Um, but also just being like, I had somebody, I'll give you some examples of, I've had a ton of people reach out to me. Um, just in the last month or so and one wrote specifically you know i know this is direct he actually wrote um willing to network slash roll tide um because he had seen that i graduated from alabama which i mean it caught my mind it caught my attention and i opened it up so it worked and he said you know i know this is bold but i've just been laid off do you know of any and he got really specific here's what i'm looking for Right. And so I was thinking about Taylor's earlier comment, and it, it also leads back to that bullet about don't try to be everything to everybody. If you don't know what you want, that's going to easily come across when you're talking to people and you're networking. And so before you get out there doing those two networking calls every single week, uh, be sure you can articulate what you want in a way that the person can easily understand it and can think about, well, how can I help you? Because the goal of networking, you know, in terms of guidance, I also tell people a lot of clients I work with are super intimidated by that or they just feel like they're asking for something and they don't want to do that. And, you know, the advice I give is don't approach it that way at all. You know, reach out to someone and say, hey, I'm, I've been laid off or I've been furloughed or I'm in transition and I'm just, you know, networking for my next opportunity. And I'd just love to hear your advice. I'd love to pick your brain, right? Um, and then be thinking the whole time you're talking to them, make it about them. Like, what is it that I hear them talking about when they tell their story that I could offer to help them, you know? And so really make it about how you can go out and put good out into the world and that stuff's going to come back to you. I think that's great advice. Um, any advice, um, from a, uh, candidate's perspective to, um, understand the, the recruiting process. So um, I think a lot of us could could relate to. I've been through the process. Um, I'm late. I'm a late stage with with a company A, but company B, which is a company I'd really like to work for, just reached out to me. Mm -hmm. How can I understand the what the recruiting process is for company B, so that I don't have to give company A an answer um, before I know if company B is going to offer me the job? Like. You know how do basically how do i understand the timeline of the recruiting process better um, and what questions do i ask to to be able to get that information i need to understand you know when i have to make a decision do we have another hour <laughs> uh so i mean i we're, yeah this this is this is a lot so first off uh, if we can go back to my slide uh, with the top 10 questions to stump a recruiter i would say like that that's a good place to start right there. That's a really good place to start. 
um, you know, on, on the, the specific job and how fast it can move. I would say if a recruiter can answer all 10 of those, um, and then they should at least get close to 10, uh, the job can move pretty quick. I, I think in a nutshell, it's asking the recruiter the process, right? I'm not going to go in because we don't have the time to go into the nuts and bolts of, of my process. And, and I'd honestly, Paige, maybe it's something we can do in the future. I'd love to hear the process from a corporate side too, because I have no idea. Yeah. Um, and I'd be interested to see kind of the differences in, um, you know, similarities between both. But I think asking the recruiter up front, hey, realistically, how fast do you think this can move? I mean, re- I mean, I, people ask me that all the time. I'm like, I'm going to be honest with you, the, the HR is slow. Hiring managers are slow. It's probably going to take three weeks. Or honestly, like, I just got a guy an offer after a 30-minute phone call last week. So it's, it, it, it varies. Yeah, I was just going to say, it so depends. A lot of it depends, too, on the size of the company, right? So smaller companies, just as a rule, they're likely to move faster. Um, at larger companies where there's a lot more people and stakeholders and a lot more of you know, buy-in, um, that's just going to take longer. The other thing I would say is ask, right? I, all the time we would have candidates just, you know, you want to be thoughtful about when you share certain information, mm-hmm. but you also want to be honest, right? Because there's nothing worse than a candidate who did not tell me where they were in the process with someone else. Um, you know, that is something that you don't want to happen either because you're creating a brand for yourself in every interaction. So you do have to be smart about it, but you, you want to be honest. And so I often had candidates say, well, here's the situation. Like I'm, I'm on round three with so-and-so company and we would decide together, right? Like I could, we could get started and I'll tell the hiring manager where you are with this other company, recognizing that something might pop on either side, right? Yeah. The other thing I would say is, you know, as you're in it, if it starts to get extended, ask again. You know, there's definitely be your own advocate. I think that's great advice. A um, couple more questions here from, from the crew. Um, do you have any uh, tips specifically for junior developers looking for their first role? I've heard most recruiters do not have positions for junior devs. So what is the best alternative? This is great. Um, first off, if you, uh, anybody who wants to text me as a junior developer, I've actually started a junior developer newsletter and a junior developer text messaging group. Um, so uh, feel free to text me or email me. My, my phone number is 615-525-4806. Again, that's 615. There it is on the slide. So all that being said, you're right. I mean, I, I would say uh, navigating the job search in general is hard for a junior developer. Mm-hmm. Um, and now as well. But I'm going to be honest. I thought about this because I knew this question would probably come up. I would say it's just as hard then as it is now for junior developers. I don't think that's changed because there is still – there's just so, there, there's so many individuals and so many, you know, net, you have national software schools doing a great job. Now you have Vanderbilt getting in on the boot camp game. And so it's just, you have all these candidates and, and, and that, I, that hasn't changed. And, and to be quite frank with you, I see, I've, I've seen as many jobs as before from a junior developer side, but I think, I think now a demo project is not enough, right? Like the NSS, uh, they, they do demo days. I, I don't think that's enough anymore. I think, I think that's incredible. And that puts you in line with everybody else. But if you want to separate yourself, I would start asking for free work. Um, and I know free work is kind of a thing. Um, I tweeted about that uh, a few months ago and it went viral for me. So like three interactions. Uh, but you know, it, it's, it's a lot of people don't like the idea of taking on free work, but I would say right now, if I were to look at a resume of a junior developer who just has code school, experience versus code school experience and they've taken on three personal projects one for a church one for their best friend's gardening club and one for their best friend's um you know um anime club developing a website for them like i'm gonna call the person with the three personal projects and so i would go ahead i was gonna say that's great advice um i personal experience here at teaming um we uh have turned down free work even um, like we just, our senior developers just don't have the time to work with some of the junior developers that we, um, have heard about or have approached us. That being said, we just took on someone, um, because of networking. One of our senior devs got to know one of the junior devs looking for a job. Um, and here we are, we, we yep. turned the table. Um, so, so same thing, like free work. Um, and that networking, man, I was, I was shocked to see our, our, um, head of development take on someone, um, after being vehemently against it. So 
<laughs> people fall in love with people. That's it. That's it. Ooh, that's good. Um, <laughs> Paige, I love that. It's so true. We hire people we like as much as, you know. We got two more questions here. Um, so we'll keep taking them as we, as we get up to the hour here. Um, how soon after applying for a job should you follow up? Is there such a thing as the wrong way to follow up? Mm. Paige, you want to go first? Paige, yeah, I, I, yeah <laughs> I've answered Taylor, every single like, you wanna, That's such a sticky one. Um, yeah. There's always a the wrong way, it. right? I mean, and we know that about everything in life. Um, but, you know, after applying a week or so, I, I think makes a lot of sense. I mean, recognizing, you know, people are busy. You know, I guarantee you recruiters are not sitting there ignoring their recs. Um, I promise you they're not. Um, there, there tends to be a lot of other things. So if I think about the recruiting teams I led, None of those recruiters were just recruiters. They all had other jobs in addition to their recruiting job, whether they were leading projects, whether they were, whether they were training hiring managers on interviewing skills, whether they were building out infrastructure, I mean, whatever, right? They were all doing things in addition to a rec load, as we called it. Um, so I guarantee you they're not sitting there ignoring. But, you know, follow-up is critical, and sometimes, you know, they can get overwhelmed, and they can't have too much on their plate, so follow-up is good. In terms of the wrong way, you know, I don't know that I would answer this just for that specific instance, because it can apply to a number of things, but one of the things we talked about often um, was, you know, despite the best efforts, I would so many times get on the phone with a candidate, or we would have a whole day planned, you know, a panel, eight or nine interviews throughout a day, and at the end of the day, the candidate, I would you know, be debriefing with them or walk out with them and they would start criticizing either one of my recruiters or a hiring manager, you know, and just really being negative about the process. And I mean, I get it, you guys. I can't tell you the number of times that I have even had that feeling of like, oh my gosh, this candidate has been sitting out in the lobby for, you know, where is the coordinator, right? So I'm not saying it doesn't happen. What I would say is try to put yourself, you know, in the, the shoes of the person receiving that and think about, you know, um, do you really want to tick off the person that you expect to advocate for you, right? And you don't, right? And so I guess to answer this specific question, is there a wrong way? Try to just check that stuff. It's such an emotional process, you know, that I know it's hard, but where you can have a plan to get out of the building, get home and call a friend to vent about it, right? Or before going in, just get all that off your chest and, you know, out of your head so that you don't step on your own foot, I guess. Um, so negativity and criticism is not going to get you far in the process. And I think it follows too, right? If you have appreciation for recruiters, right? I've never been placed by an external recruiter. But there are, I could, I could name you five that check in with me every so often. Um, sure. and, and man, I think it's because, I mean, I think anyway, like I appreciate the work they've done to, to try to place me um, so much. It's hard, right? Um, and I think if you appreciate that, right, they want to work with you and they want to advocate for you, maybe not for this role, but for another role in the future. Um, so one yeah. of the things we used to always say, and Taylor, you'll probably have your own, but like, you know, a recruiter is only as good as their last placement. And so, mm -hmm. you know, Kate, you're exactly right. Like we want to make people look good, right? And recruiters want to have candidates look phenomenal because it only reflects on the job that they've done. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it, where we can build partnership, that's been the biggest key to success. One more question. Um, this is a little bit of a long one, um, but given the current environment and your and your point of job seekers being at a disadvantage in terms of opportunities right now, right? It's it's definitely a hiring manager's market. Um, what do you see as the future? What do you see as the future looking like when the economy starts to grow and unemployment starts to decline? Will we see a mass migration of workers leaving jobs that they took out of necessity? Mm. Paige, you first again. I love when you do that. Um, it's a, it's such a great question. Um, I, you know, I don't know if we'll see a mass because I, the people I've been talking to and the questions and calls I've been getting, a lot of folks are, you know, not immediately when they got the notice of their job being eliminated or their furlough, um, but a few weeks later, they're in a place of like, okay, maybe this is an opportunity in my life where I can, you know, step back and take a little bit of a 
a pivot or, you know, a breather and be planful, you know, about my approach. And so I'm not hearing from a lot of people right now that they are grasping at the first thing. You know, certainly there are some, but that I'm not hearing a lot of that. So, so I don't know that we're going to see a mass. Um, what I do think we will see is just like we talked earlier, a flooding. And so, you know, there's going to be so many more candidates for each role. And we're going to see some new roles. You know, this whole work from home, we've just proven it out, right? Um, if you didn't work for a company before that did, uh, now, you know, every company has. And so I think we're starting to see the beginnings of some really interesting, you know, what does work look like? Um, and so there are going to be some new roles that I think will come and, and people will have opportunity in new areas. I think that's a great answer. We're right at the top of the hour. Steve, um, anything we're, we're missing here? Do you want to close us out? Yeah, you guys have done a great job. I want to thank Kate, Paige, and Taylor for participating in the panel and, and controlling this. Uh, and as we close it out, if any help, contact them. Uh, they're willing to, to talk to you. The contact information has been on the screen um, several times. Uh, and also, for anybody that's interested, participate in the May 12th uh, job fair. Again, register at technology. Uh, council.com slash job fair. Uh, register there. Also look at technology.com, our calendar uh, for any other events that are coming up, but we'd love to see you at the job fair. Well, thank you everybody and have a good day. Good, good luck on your job search. Yes, thank you. Thinking about you all. Yes. Thanks team. Bye y'all. Yep, absolutely. Thanks y'all.